Samsung's Galaxy S22 Ultra is out, the geeky benches are in, and we're all about to discover if Qualcomm's latest, greatest, Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, finally, the rock level just lays Apple's A15 to utter desolation and waste. Spoilers. So hit that subscribe button and bell to help support some common sense tech tube, and let's do this. First up, in the phantom blue corner, coming in on Samsung's four nanometer process and on the ARM V9 instruction set architecture, we have Qualcomm's newly rebranded Snapdragon 8 Gen 1, or S8G1, which sadly just isn't the next Stargate spinoff. But in the six color corner, coming in on Taiwan Semiconductor's second generation five nanometer process and on the ARM V8 ISA, we have Apple's still bionic branded A15. And at the sound of the bell, the judge for this rumble in the stonks will be PC Mag's own Sasha Segan. And the winner is, wait, no, wait, no, wait, no. Surprise face emoji. This cannot be right because Samsung's process is at four nanometer and TSMC's is still at five nanometer and carry the one, divide by zero, that's more nanometer. But turns out those are marketing names, not actual physical measurements. And TSMC's and 5P process is currently just better than Samsung's 4LPE. But wait another damn minute because Snapdragon is on ARM V9 and Apple is still on ARM V8, which floating math symbols is more ISA. But turns out Apple largely drove ARM V8 and ARM64 and their license lets them pretty much do just whatever they want to do with it. And they've been doing exactly that kind of stuff they wanted to with it for almost a decade now. And while I'd love, I would love to be wrong about this, it feels like ARM V9 is mostly just ARM's attempt to replicate what Apple's been doing and package it up for their other licensees. Some new and hopefully interesting vector matrix multiplication capabilities aside. But I still, I still don't get it because didn't Apple's CPU gains grind to a halt and their future look dim as the impact from CPU engineer Exodus's Exodai, Tanuvia and Rivas just start to bleed in? I mean, that was actual real fanfic written almost immediately after A15 was announced. And then just so schadenfreude tastically reblogged to bait clicks pretty much across the whole entire techosphere. But then turned out when actual devices got into actual hands, A15 continued building, not just on the bionic architecture, but on the whole low, slow, wide approach that Apple's been relentless about basically forever. You know, that whole, a river could ultimately push more water than a fire hose approach. And just maniacally obsessed with efficiency and achieving performance through that efficiency, specifically in the case of A15, with more efficient performance cores, way more performant efficiency cores, kind of monstrously new graphics cores, up to five of them this time, and a ridiculous amount of system cache, along with a continued push into off-core features, with things like ProRes media engines. And just to put the cherry on the Silicon Sunday, Apple's team is fully integrated, which means the chipset architects can sit down with the hardware engineers, the software engineers, everybody, and figure out the exact capability that they need to deliver for the next one, two, three generations of devices with pure optimization and absolutely zero transistor waste, just no dark silicon. And then they're running iOS on top of that, a fully native operating system with native apps. But I've got that dive up for you already and I'll link to it in the description below the like button. Either way, anyway, rather than grinding to a halt in between process shrink years, it seems pretty much like another talk leap forward, making this year's expected shrink down to TSMC's four nanometer process look kind of all shades of bright meaning A16 Bionic, Cyborg, whatever they call it, is gonna ship in the iPhone 14 this fall, months before Qualcomm even announces S8 G2 Atlantis, and nearly half a year before Samsung can even begin to cram it into a Galaxy, don't call it Note 23 Ultra. And as advantages go, that's kind of the hugest. And I say that as somebody who Shyamalan style plot twist really, really likes the Galaxy S22 Ultra. It's got a bunch of truly useful features that I wish Apple would hurry up and add to the iPhone already, including, and especially for me, <laughs> pen support, which pretty much makes it into the perfect iPad Nano for your pocket. But as to that whole brain drain thing, you know, I know, everybody knows, Apple Silicon Bench runs silly deep because part of the process of great artist shipping is having great editors, great auteurs even, 
to help them figure out what to and what not to ship. Until Qualcomm, with or without Nuvia, ships objectively better chips than Apple, I'm talking way, way better than Canadian ketchup chips. It's all just silicon rag thirst traps. And I mean objectively better performance and efficiency, not just goosing voltage to post some high scores that shred battery life, even as they throttle harder than a Top Gun sequel release schedule in anything even approaching an actual phone-sized enclosure. Because as Sasha points out in his tests, the Geekbench results just drop precipitously when the phone gets warm. And I'll defend Qualcomm by saying, physics is an absolute and total jerk, and everything, everything throttles, including A15's five-core GPU, if you really push it. But very few non-benchmarkers are ever gonna run on the red for any extended period of time. But you still want to be designing for the enclosure, not for the benchmark LARPers, especially on mobile, because unlike Alder Lake, you can't just liquid cool to fit it into your favorite mini tower. Silicon is entirely unforgiving, so you have to, you have to play the long game. And I know a lot of people will just say, none of this matters. Phones, modern phones are already beyond OP, just way fast enough, and that they scroll fine, they game fine, and it's more about experiences than specs feature sets than chipsets. And I know that because I'm the one who started that whole pre-TikTok trend. Been there, snarked that. But what many people forget or miss or just gloss over is that it has to happen over time. Experience at launch only matters to tech fanatics who swap phones faster than memes. Real people, actual human beings, don't just keep one new hotness until the next comes the next week. They keep their only hotness for years. And with Samsung finally strapping on their big Apple pants, and promising updates for up to five years now, those chips have to have enough headroom for those updates for those five years. In other words, they have to be able to maintain those experiences under the weight of new and added feature sets. Scrolls smooth, burns on Genshin Impact in 2022 is LOL, but in 2026, in 2027, who's LOLing now? Sure as hell better still be us. Because Apple's been doing just exactly that proving just exactly that, going back five or six years now. And I'd love, I'd all caps love to see that from Samsung and Qualcomm and Google and everyone because competition is good for everyone. And by everyone, I mean specifically us. Mostly because none of this is really a secret anymore. Apple has said a lot of it out loud. Just check out my interview with their VP of Silicon and VP of Mac product marketing. You can watch it ad free, sponsor free, and the extended version on Nebula. Also exclusive and bonus videos like my new studio tour series where I'm going through everything I use to make these videos. Both part one, camera gear, and part two, mics and sound treatment are already live and I'm working on part three, lighting, right now. Basically everything all of you in the comments and on Twitter always ask for but just wouldn't work at all on this channel given how YouTube works but is exactly how Nebula was designed to work where I have the luxury of making videos that just don't have to be optimized at all for YouTube, but where I know the nerdiest, most hardcore of you will absolutely love them. All ad-free, sponsor-free on Nebula and bundled in for free when you sign up with today's sponsor at curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie or click on the link below. And right now, because you're watching this video, you can get CuriosityStream on sale for 26% off, less than 15 bucks a year less than the price of a fancy bistro burger for the whole entire year. And that includes their thousands of amazing documentaries and series like Dream the Future, Entertainment, narrated by Sigourney Weaver and focusing on virtual reality headsets, which are reaching the masses and can already let people dive into spectacular new worlds. Like from our couches, we can now float through space, fly over New York or zip along roller coasters. But what will it be like in the future? It's the absolute best way to support educational creators directly and just the best damn deal in streaming today. For over 26% off CuriosityStream, less than 15 bucks a year and Nebula bundled in for free. Just click the button on the screen or go to curiositystream.com slash Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out the channel and so does hitting up this playlist for way more on the A15 and where the A16 will be taking us next. So hit up that playlist and I'll see you in the next video.